welcome everybody and um, it's great to see a good crowd. It means the big bush comes going well as well. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank Woodford for having me come and do a day's work of activities, feeding my passion and interests. It's always good. Um, but I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, um, particularly in this country and throughout Australia, and recognising their continuing uh, connection with land. Something we can learn a lot from, waters and their culture. And I pay my respects for, to their elders past, present and emerging. So just to say a little bit of I've been involved with Woodford since 2003 and there's a whole lot of projects uh, on site that basically happen to be of enhancement for butterflies and other invertebrate biodiversity. It's always been about small creatures. And um, forgive my hands, they I can't talk without using my hands, so they tend to move of their own accord. Um, yes, yeah, so um, Woodford gives me the opportunity to speak about the topic that's so dear to my heart, it's the first presentation I ever did at Toastmasters in 1983 and it was called Save the Snail. We've, we've saved the well, let's save, save the snail. Because <laughs> at the time there was an article about a Polynesian species of snail that was down to seven um, specimens. Um, so um, to just let me start the scene, I like to start with a, um, a short tale that for me is a metaphor for what we're doing to the planet, but how we're doing it. So um, it's dark and there's a man who's searching for keys under the light, under a light to street light. And a passerby comes along and sees him and says, can I help you? Are you looking for something? And a man says, yes, I've lost my keys. Okay then, I'll give you a hand. And they start searching and they're searching further and further out and there's no keys to be found. And so after a short while, our passerby says, um, they don't appear to be here. Where did you lose them? And our man says, well, I lost them over there, indicating some distance away. Then why are we looking here? Ah, uh, there's more light here. <laughs> and seriously, this is the way we operate. I need to find out which cognitive bias that particular one is. I'm looking at cognitive biases at the so for me, that's a metaphor for biodiversity conservation. It's also a metaphor for what I've actually done in my practice here at Woodford and in my own places. Um, our biology has prepared us to see big things. After all, big things might be us. At one stage, we were just a middle order predator. Now we're at the top of the um, traffic levels so of the food group. But um, so. Unless it was somehow threatening to us, we didn't, no, many of us didn't learn to look for little things, and certainly not in the culture we have now. So, um, I was having a bit of fun with alliteration this particular day, so um, this talk is predicated on a new book that I co-authored with Dick Copeman. There's copies in the general store, um, called Inviting Nature to Dinner. And it's about the benefits of having biodiversity in your garden. We've targeted it to the gardeners and permacultures. Um, yeah, so I'll be I'll come back to this slide at the end, but um, I'll be talking about four topics and let me actually start there. Okay. So uh, too fast. Very touch sensitive. So yes, so the first topic is animal biodiversity is the domain of invertebrates. Invertebrates are small creatures that don't have backbones, um, and I'll be talking a lot more about that in a few minutes. But they actually do amazing things, and I can only touch on some of the amazing things, which is a butterfly's life cycle. So here's a bunch of um, black Jezebel eggs. They're black. Like Je Jezebels are a group of butterflies, and um, they're just starting to get ready to hatch. So here are a few have hatched. You can see when they're ready to go because their little black heads start nibbling through the egg case, and then they eat their egg cases. 
and then after a while they've eaten them all and that's the butterfly they turn into so that image shows some more mature caterpillars sort of little forgive me i'm not good with left and right um little this side um uh, and that particular species eats mistletoes which i'm not talking about specifically but is a very important ecological plants so even that process of hatching and what they do is uh, amazing to be able to grow and uh, become butterflies they and good have their skeletons or their skins on the outside where we've got a skeleton um, this is a slide showing an egg of a lemon migrant so related to the black jessicals but quite a different species <coughs> And um, there's an egg and there's a bigger caterpillar eating the leaf and it's more than likely to eat the egg as well. They're not very fussy about their sources of food. I mean, they're very fussy about the leaves they eat, but they'll eat eggs or anything on it. Um, top, this side is a fairly young caterpillar. It's probably, it wouldn't be even a day old and a slightly larger one. So they need to, I need water, sorry. Um, they need to grow and shed their skins four to five times to different species do slightly different things and then they're mature enough to molt uh, to sorry they molt four or five times they're called instars and then they're ready to pupate so here's one that was the top one is getting ready to shed its skin. It's attached itself by the rear end. The one on that side has actually nearly pulled out of its skin. Uh, and there it's out of its skin completely. And as it pulls out of its skin, it actually takes all of the linings of all its breathing tubes called spiracles as well. And you can see that. When you sit there with a the camera doing this sort of stuff, you start seeing it all happen. So, um, The, um, the thing about um, us and all creatures is we all start life, um, our individual lives, as an egg. And we need food to grow and we need high protein food to grow, or at least as high protein as we get it. And all creatures need, well, food to grow, to places to thrive and shelter, places where we can um, live. Mates, so we can continue our line uh, and food for our offsprings and somewhere where we can do our decomposing role. We're all decomposers. Some species are more decomposers than others. So we all have digestive tracts is what I'm talking about. Um, so all of that's happening with these creatures and they're very good at composting a lot of their food. So in the process, oh, back in 1986, um, I raised hundreds of these, it would be 150 or so, of these lemon migrant caterpillars. And um, it, it showed me something very salient as a life's lesson. So every one of that batch back then, which was growing on the cassia fistulas that, um, that were growing, uh, an introduced golden lane tree that was growing on um, uh, Vulture Street in West End, it was on my route. They were all like the bottom one on that side. They were green with a black and white stripe. And I've been doing these talks for a very long time. And I swore black and blue for nearly all talks until about 2015, that all lemon migrants were easy to pick because they were green with a black and white stripe. I got a bit shocked in 2015. And you know, this might seem like a little detail, but there's so much you can learn about life's lessons, if nothing else, uh, from doing this work. So I raised a batch from a few different street trees that the council introduced street, tree, street trees that the council had planted. And I came up with at least four color variants, some of which I couldn't distinguish from other species until they had actually um, gone through that whole life cycle. So for me, that is, when it comes to nature, can someone shift that? Because it's just not on me. Stand back on me, please. Just shift it. No, no, just the top. Swivel the top. 
Thank you. All kind of people, but I actually need the wind. Um, so, in a lot of ways, we're like blind, the proverbial blind people with the elephant. So, one person um, gets to feel the trunk and says, oh, the trunk is like a giant fire hose. The second person gets to feel a leg and says, no, you're wrong. The trunk is, uh, the, uh, an elephant is like a giant pillar. And the third person says, oh, you couldn't be more wrong because they're feeling the flank. And um, they say, oh, but it's actually like a parchment. And I keep coming back to that fairly simple story that we've probably all heard because I, I think it's yet another metaphor for what we're doing um, on the planet. None of us see the, the whole of it. And so the question from a systems point of view becomes, what's the rest of the story? And a whole lot of my work is now done in the framework of systems thinking. So yeah, so my blindness was about the fact that the caterpillars were just green with a black and white stripe, and that turned out to be completely wrong. So, um, and so it's really important that we think about how we're being blinded by partial information. And I, given the threat that insects and wildlife on Earth, other than ourselves and possibly ourselves as well as under, um, we need to start seeing vertebrates in a, in a new light. And that light is transforming our thinking about them. And so to do a little bit of transformative thinking, I'm um, just going to show you a quick cycle of a uh, little migrant pupating. So this one has done its four or five skin sheds and has developed its pupil skin underneath its caterpillar skin and set itself up to um, with a little attachment at the tail end and a swing two thirds of the way through that's a bit hard to see. And then it slowly starts splitting out of the skin along the back edge. I hope you can see that. Um, it's a bit hard to see. So here it comes. So, and so it's just that skin just somehow splits through past it all. And then it this is a process whereby it's wriggling and squirming and wriggling and squirming and does it for ages and um, eventually gets rid of the skin most of the time, not all the time. I suspect that skin is a bit of a signal to predators, so it doesn't want it there because it puts a lot of energy into getting rid of it. And here it's settled into its, um, its form to become a butterfly. And I've recently discovered that if it's even slightly flattened on any angle, it won't actually emerge as an appropriately shaped creature because it happens when you raise hundreds of species, hundreds of specimens. So this one comes in at least two colour forms. And um, now we're going to move through the next transformation. So in that process, it's becoming a, a butterfly. Towards the um, the end of its pupil patient stage, its um, crystal stage, it gets ready to emerge so you can start seeing the wings pattern and um, and its abdominal segments stretch out. So he, he or she comes, I didn't pay attention to its gender, it flips over and it pumps up its wings and it's after a little while it's ready to fly. And this butterfly is a really good one to do with children because it's very quick. It's a caterpillar for a week, it's a chrysalis for a week, and then you've got the adult. But when you're starting, it's a real challenge because it comes in nine different colour forms. Now, some of them are male and some of them are female, and I haven't married them up yet. So um, that's just a few of them that I got from that last batch in 2015. So to move on to a sort of slightly different angle on it all, this I'm starting to talk about uh, animal diversity as the domain of invertebrates. So this image is a, called a species scape, uh, and it's a more recent one and a simplified one. In the illustration, the area covered by the creature indicates how many species there are roughly. So Arthropods, spiders, flies, insects um, are, 
are the spider and the fly. Invertebrates are the spider, the fly, the paramecium, the flatworm, the earthworm, the roundworm, the mollusk, the um, uh, and the starfish and the jellyfish. And it's only seven of the phyla. There's 33 phyla of invertebrates. But a lot of them have got less than 500, uh, 5,000 species, so they're not on the diagram. So we're represented by the elk. So that's how big, under the mushrooms. Vertebrates, so everything with the backbone is represented by the elk. The frog, that's also represents reptiles. The bird and the fish. I think that's it, yeah. So you can see, I don't think many of us understand the relative scale of importance to the creatures we're paying attention to versus the creatures that are on the planet. So collectively, um, invertebrates make up 95%, according to the latest IUCN data, they come to 95% of all the animal species on the planet. So creatures that don't have that bones are 95%, and that's of named species. We actually don't even know how many invertebrates there are yet because most of them, the work hasn't been done on it. In fact, any one of us can just go looking and usually find something new, but we don't know what we're looking for. Um, so it's hard to know if it's new or not. So they're rarely in the light of our gaze. So the line is, since invertebrates don't have backbones, they can't stand up for themselves, so we have to start doing it for them. So um, I credit that to my daughter. <laughs> she's, she's brilliant with words. Um, so, and so when I say 95%, it's, as I said, main species. So vertebrates at the moment um, counted about 72,500 species. Now, there's a whole lot of... Um, well, some media happens. The media I see is a whole lot of media uh, happens when a new cryptic species of, of, of a vertebrate gets found. We don't get that kind of story when vertebrates are found. Um, and as the DNA work's being done, we're finding that there's more and more what are called cryptic species that, to our eye, they look like they're the same species, but they're not. I can't even imagine what's going to happen when we start doing a lot more of that work on invertebrates. So at this point, about 1.5 million have been named and we don't, of invertebrates, things without backbones, and we don't know how many there are. And estimates vary widely from like 3 million to 5 to 10. In the past, there was a figure of 30 million. That's been discounted, but I'm not so sure, especially once the DNA work starts being done. So, um, yeah, so the invertebrates are critical to all other life on Earth. So in order to pull this book together and for me to get my head around it a bit, I was having quite a challenge. Um, and so I use it, I use the data and some other um, sources to come up with this diagram. So all animals are represented by the light pink uh, circle at the top, which is the elk, the fish, the frog. Um, and invertebrates by the light pink. And then the next inner circle that's a bit darker is insects. At this stage, there's actually now a challenge from mites because there's millions of mites, but most ecologists ignore mites when they're doing studies on insects. And when asked, they apparently they say, oh, there's so many of them. Um, so, so they're completely unexplored and they're very tiny, so they're harder to work on, but most life on Earth is very tiny, at least to our eyes. So the next darker pink circle um, is um, the 34% of all animal life that are plant-eating insects. So just think about all those pretty pristine plants that there are throughout suburbia that have got no chew marks, not the slightest bit of damage. They're not feeding those animals. So the core idea is that everything that has evolved uh, on Earth evolved in a place or a region in relationship with all the other things that were evolving at the time. And each of them was making sure that they could find mates, they could have shelter, they could find food. So I'm trying to start 
giving an inkling of the complexity that I'm finding just absolutely stunning. So the upshot of that is that everything has its own role to play and we're way too inclined to think that things are interchangeable, but they're not. Um, if it's evolved into a different species, it's got a different role and sometimes multiple roles. So, and we all do need a livelihood. So that piece of information has led me down a particular path. So if there are so many creatures on Earth, small creatures that we're not seeing and we're not paying attention to, oh, I forgot to say that in a dot is um, the 0.34% of insects that have pest potential, not even the ones that are pests, that have pest potential. So nearly all of our human endeavour has actually been on that 0.34%. And a fair portion of our knowledge base, it's changing a bit, but a fair portion of our knowledge base is predicated on that, input, on that small sample. And also our perspectives on life. So, um, so between that last uh, diagram and the species scape, I'm hoping I'll give you a bit more of an idea of complexity. This is all about complexity and our amazing capacity to simplify everything. So, um, and, and it's, not a, it's none of our faults. I mean, I did a biology ecology degree back in the 70s, and these were the kind of food webs, and, and Web of Life was the, the book at school, and these were the kinds of food web diagrams that um, we were shown. In that first one, there's one blanch. One blanch somewhere stuck in the middle. And this one, at least there's about 10 animals with a few little arrows between them. So like our whole society has been skewed to not understand the role of the vast diversity of life on Earth. Um, so to, um, and yes, yeah, so we can't blame, there's no one to blame, it's just we need to start changing our perspective. So for the new book, we worked with a, um, uh, an illustrator, Paula Peters, and this isn't quite finished, but um, it's a work in progress. So it's, it's my position now that for every food web we represent, we should be representing for 19 invertebrates for every one vertebrate. So I start imagining what our food web diagrams would be like if we start doing that. This is a mixture of a food web and a trophic level diagram and a, a few other um, pieces of information. So, um, okay, so the, the core process that I'm talking about is the sun provides energy to plants, which turn that energy through photosynthesis into carbohydrate and a little bit of protein. The 34% of insects that are eating those plants, if we give them to them, are, are turning that protein into, sorry, that carbohydrate into protein. And they're very efficient at it. Um, the crickets, it's something I saw, I haven't verified it, but the crickets that are now turning up as cricket powder for food are said to convert 90% of what they eat into protein. Cows convert about 10%. So they're, even if those figures are a little out, there's still a massive um, variance in the conversion rates. And nearly all animals need to feed their juveniles, especially higher order animals, need to feed their juveniles high protein food. So mosquitoes actually sting, female mosquitoes sting you to collect blood because that's high protein to feed to their, their larvae to, to make their eggs grow quite better. Um, except for the nice parasitic, sorry, predatory uh, mosquito, which is, I'm dying to work out how to breed. Um, it's got a big curved beak. If you find one with a big curved beak, it's larvae eat out mosquito eggs. So, so let's not wipe out all mosquitoes. Sorry, that's a very common question I get. What would happen if we work out on the Sorry, we create a disaster. Um, so, yes, yeah, so 
So with the piece of information that everything has evolved in a place or a region in relationship with all the other things that have evolved in a place and a region, recently someone called me a native plant Nazi and I now happily claim that <laughs> because it's a very good reason for doing it because um, we're doing way too much mixing and there's a bit more explanation of that in a minute. So, um, so there's this massive amount of complexity in plant-insect interactions and, and really the more you learn about them, the more amazing they are. I'll divert a bit into another more complex one because I'm actually running a walk later to try and find fireflies. We found two on the first camp. Um, they're a bit hard to spot at the moment, but it's been a dry year. So I, I, in this case, I'm just talking about the kinds of complexity. So fireflies are a type of beetle that uh, have larvae that are carnivorous and they eat um, the little tiny micro snails. And Australia's full of little tiny like, micro snails. These eat, and I think most Australian snails eat um, fungi. That's what I've heard. I haven't followed it up. Go follow it up. Um, so there are 23 different species of fireflies on the eastern seaboard, seven are in the, in the region. We're finding it harder and harder to find fireflies in our neighbourhoods because we keep clearing out um, their capacity to have a home and shelter and breed and find mates. And so, and I'm saying that to bring out the point that the more we modify environments, like we're doing all over the place, um, populations of everything get lost from that particular area because the simpler it is the less that it can support. So I, um, this is a picture I went to take, I need to take it again, but at, um, for the new book and it was showing what happens um, when an introduced plant takes over the ground covers in an area. So this was a novel uh, conservation reserve, it's one of my, it was one of my favourite go-to places because I could recapture a childhood experience of walking through vegetation. It had been cleared a bit for overhead power lines, but it hadn't been modified much. And so you walk through and there's creatures going in every direction, which is just my delight. Um, and I was happy with it for quite a long time because I could have that experience there. And then I looked a bit further over and there was some creeping lantana that the nursery industry promised us would not escape from our gardens. And it's just taking over whole areas. And I was just back there a few weeks ago and it had taken over even more. And where that plant, and where a whole lot of introduced pasture grasses, all sorts of other plants have taken in, even here, um, those plants cannot support much life. And we'll go into that a bit more. So a much smaller patch, not 20 metres away, um, was a bit that was less disturbed. And there were at least five different species in a much smaller patch. And if you think about how many insects, and, and insects are just a representation of the universe, each of these plants will have a whole constellation of animals that they support in one way or another. So the only thing that was growing through the, um, the creeping lantana, and that's only an example, uh, was a bit of lamandra. And it, I went back to it, as I said, a few weeks ago, and um, the lamandra was still there, and the, and the plant was really heavily wilted from all the drought but there was still nothing else growing through it. So, so that's why locally involved um, species require local native plants. So that spot that's being invaded is losing that 95% of invertebrates that might have been possible in that area. Um, so yeah, so the large majority of of the anim animals I'm talking about, even mammals and vertebrates, I'll start that in a different spot. Um, all animals range from being generalists and can eat a wide, wide range of things to being highly specialised, so they're down to eating one or two or three plants. The really specialised ones are considered to be at the end of their evolution line, I hope, but I don't think we want to lose them because they still have a place. Um, Thinking of black humour, but us rats and cockroaches are probably the biggest generalists on the planet, um, given the spectrum of foods that humans can eat. And so each of those those plants will have its constellation of creatures that are using it. Now I've spent oh sorry that later. 
Um, so uh, one of the processes of becoming different species is involved with how the plants produce defence chemicals. So for the species that have been studied, that is, <clears throat> um, plants will produce chemicals, or some of them will, once they start being chewed by a herbivore. There's more insect herbivores than most other types of herbivores. What that does is it also brings in the, um, the predators and parasitoids of the thing that's eating the plant. It has a secondary effect. It brings in the predators and the parasitoids of the predators and the parasitoids that are eating the creature that's eating the plant. But over one of the speciation processes that we're somewhat interfering with is um, that this is happening at a local basis. So the insects are fighting back. So they have different ways of adapting to those plant chemicals or there's a whole lot of other ways that plants do it, uh, becoming tough um, is another. And so there's this driver process where plants are becoming different species and insects are becoming different, are splitting uh, as they adapt to the, those local variations. So when you start mixing up plants from all over, um, they might be the same species, but they may actually have uh, adaptations to their local environment. This is what made me a that local native plant Nazi. Um, so, yeah, so these are sort of the hidden things I think that most people don't know. So there's actually two macrosanias that are uh, in central Queensland that look very similar, but they're actually pollinated by different strips. And that's one of those speciation processes. So in terms of um, when you have got lots of lo local native plants or host plants, I started just with host plants, you start bringing in the creatures that are going to eat the insects that you're, you've made um, room for by growing local native plants. And so down the bottom there was a, uh, a wasp that had very neatly butchered a uh, hawk moth caterpillar taken out of its guts and um, was cutting it up into balls to take it back to its nest. Uh, up at the top was a very tame paper nest wasp that I had for years. Um, they got stroppy in hot weather, but so do I. Um, and the fan is off me again. Please. Um, I suffer from heat. Um, yeah, so um, Thank you. Um, so the top is an acuminin wasp, and uh, they're often parasitoids. Uh, that beautiful little Christmas cocoon is actually an introduced, um, I only found out recently, is an introduced biocontrol agent for a particular group of moths. I suspect it's um, also become um, a parasitoid for um, uh, lemon migrant caterpillars. And there's a cabbage white. So the general principle or thought here is that, and you can see it happening in lots of situations, the more diversity of plants you've got, the more different creatures are eating those local native plants, the more general, more generalist predators and parasitoids. So the parasitoid um, kills the, um, the host that it's using and um, predators will just nibble or maybe eat the whole of you but they don't eat the insides of you. Um, well, they will, lions will eat the whole lot of you, but it's a different process if you see what I mean. Um, not being very clear here, but forgive me. So, this is a sort of another lot of different types of um, uh, predators and um, parasitoids. So down the bottom is a lace swing, and that's a whole family called, uh, sorry, the yeah, order, order Neuroptera. There's heaps of them, I need to look up. For the next version of the book, I'm looking up how many different species there are in these orders, because um, I know it's massive. They've got very predatory larvae, and we, at last week's um, bush camp, we were doing creatures of the night, and we had some that came to the light, but there's ones that have got that look like crane mantises and we have a few, they're called mantiscids. They sit there and they try and eat everything on the screen. It's quite interesting to watch. Um, there's, people think of 
uh, plant set, bugs as sap sucking insects. There's at least three families of bugs that have become predators. One of them is um, is a shield bug, or at least some of the species in it have become predators, and it's um, eating our little day flying moth um, uh, caterpillar. Uh, as a common brown assassin bug, they're, they're the most generalist around as far as I can tell, and very widespread. It's eating a three-line beetle. Three-line beetles are considered a garden pest. I've, I've never had the problem. Up the top here is a type of fly. There's a family of fly called tapnid flies that are parasitoids on, well, a whole lot of things. I had one that was parasitizing the eggs of um, a tent spider that I had in my stairwell years ago. But here it was stalking a clearly swallowtail caterpillar, and um, it didn't get it because I actually grazed that one through. But we did spend some time chasing it away. And um, I was like, Jumping spiders. A lot of jumping spiders actually eat other spiders. So if you've got jumping spiders, you've got some increasing complexity happening. Okay. So the other reason that I'm become very vocal about local native plants is a piece of work that I found um, in a book by an ecology professor called Douglas Tallamy. Uh, called Bringing Nature Home. And um, he was revegetating uh, a patch of land he bought. Uh, he's, they've got the same in the States as we have, marching invasives across the landscape, less and less local natives. Um, and he compared woody native plants that were um, yeah, woody local native with what they call aliens. And he found that his woody native plants supported 35 times more biomass of caterpillars than did the non-natives. Now I mentioned before that all higher life forms, as we like to think of ourselves, need to feed their juveniles high protein food. That's 35 times more food for birds because all those terrestrial Australian birds are considered to feed their nestlings insects, irrespective of what they're eating as adults. At least that's what I've heard from Daryl Jones, who's a professor of urban wildlife ecology. So if it's wrong, blame him for me. <laughs> but uh, it's it, it's pretty off. It's pretty observable. So if that was a number, that would be three thousand five hundred percent. It's not a number, but just to, everyone likes percents. Um, and even if it's a few times out, it's still massive. I haven't found that piece of data corroborated yet, but um, anyway, moving along. So, the contention for the new book is that our local gardens and spaces and habitat groups can be playing a major role in, um, a critical role in rebuilding ecosystems as much as possible. We're never going to get them back quickly, uh, but we can make a big difference even in a small space. So, um, in 1987, this was, so my garden is part of the basis of, um, of this particular book and the talk and my experience, other than the experience I've gained from working here. And so it was pretty much, my daughter's term for it is green desolation, I like that better. Scorched earth is this. Green desolation is it's still green but it looks, it's not feeding much. And so, yeah, there are a few um, Mediterranean fruit trees in the backyard, and a big veggie patch a bit further down, and an olive tree. And it was grass. I'm a bit allergic to grass. Um, I've got none left. I haven't mowed in at least 25 years. Um, but anyway, so this is my patch is a 405 square metre, 16 perch block in West End in Brisbane. And it's not close to any really good habitat. Like, three and a half kilometres to Mount Kutha as the crow flies, five or so from White's Hill and Tui Forest. I can't remember the figures exactly, but... And it was a strawberry farm in the 1800s, so it's been modified for a long time. And this is what it looked like back in 2018. Oh, I do have to point out a very good picture of my thumb. <laughs> it's the only picture I ever took because I really didn't like the look of it. And I didn't notice the bum until sometime later because it was slightly. 
which is all I get developed. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's now many owners later, and it's now basically, well, somebody described it as a living garden laboratory, which was very helpful, with a Beatrix Potter aesthetic, for a, a landscape architect. And I thought, oh, I'll take that. Um, not that Beatrix probably knows a bunch about Australia and well off, but anyway, that's not enough. So over the time, 90 different host plants were planted on the block, and a lot of them have died out with droughts because I don't. The plant has to survive and thrive in my books. There's about 50 different species left, but over that time, from 1987, I've raised just shy of 50 different species of butterflies that I know of because I've actually documented their life cycles. Uh, from the plants that I was growing. Now at that point it was, if it was a host plant, we planted it. Um, we didn't, uh, we weren't looking at specifically local native at that time. So, but what you can do on a little block like that, not connected to any other um, areas, is you can attract what I call the FIFO jobs, the fly in, fly out on butterflies. Um, the females fly in, find the plant, lay a few eggs, fly off. Um, and the males fly in, look for girls, find them or don't find them, and fly off. And you can't actually establish a colony, or at least not a long term colony. So we need bigger areas, but it's good to have, I'm happy to have this as a demonstration. So, um, so here was me picking winners and looking for keys in the light. Um, this is on my website if you want to just download it. Um, so the, the food plants for insects, well, the, the best known food plants are those for butterflies and some moths, especially moths that are more obvious during the day, but there's just lists of the ones for butterflies that are really reasonably easy to get. There's way less information about the food plants for a whole range of other insects that are plant eaters. And I, I personally don't want to even particularly specialise in insects anymore, but this is the core experience I come with. So back in 2005, when I've done another book called Create More Butterflies, um, a group of four of us with about 50 years or 60 years worth of post-plant experience pulled this list together uh, from the Butterfly and I do its club. Um, so it's, it's grounded in a bit of experience now. I'm not saying that these plants are going to work everywhere, and I would now look at what's my regional ecosystem, what plants grew there, what plants maybe grew in a slightly dry ecosystem that's not very far away, and I'd be choosing to plant those because we just don't know what the other plants are supporting. But it's a good place to start because you can catch your teeth on a whole lot of issues um, by doing this. So, um, so there are 360 non host plants for butterflies in South East Queensland and Northern New South Wales that um, feed 200 or so butterflies out of the 400 species of butterflies. And there's no real difference between butterflies and moths, but butterflies just tend to be a bit more conspicuous. So, yes, yeah, so as I was saying, these plants may not be the best ones for your location, but my take is if you've got a highly urbanised area, then you've got a bit more room to move because anything you do is going to be better than absolutely nothing at all. Um, but I'll go on to talk about just two, uh, two to start with, um, and then a few more. Because of the, the complexity that I've been able to observe that these, um, this particular plant has generated in a garden. So this is a climbing centre and there's actually examples of it around all the toilet blocks because that's one of the five or six projects that I've done on site over the years. Um, the plant itself supported three local butterflies and now a fourth that's been self-introduced as far as we can tell from North Queensland. So it feeds the yellow migrant that's on display, the um, small green, sorry, the small grass yellow, the large grass yellow, and now the pale ciliated blue, which eats the flowers. Um, and there's a picture of caterpillars and chrysalises in the plant. But the other, grown in for sun, you can see this more easily, um, you get more of the butterflies. Normally it scrambles through vegetation. 
Um, the flowers need to be pollinated by buzz pollinating bees. So this, the whole thing about honeybees is just, if you're getting the story that honeybees are a problem for Australia, like they're a problem for some of the species in Australia, they're an introduced species in case that information hasn't gone through. We have somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 and maybe up to 3,000 species of our own native bees. And 11 of them produce small amounts of honey, but the bees are about like that big. The biggest ones are about double the size. Um, but both pollinating bees have to, some, there's a whole lot of plants that have to be vibrated at a particular frequency before they release their pollen. And so anything else visiting those flowers is basically just robbing them. So I always like saying so. Bees can be robbers too. And buzz pollinating bees can be robbers because they'll drill into the stem of um, flowers and just suck out the nectar as well. So. Bees are not nearly as innocent and hardworking as we're led to believe. <laughs> um, but anyway, so um, so it's bee it, so I had teddy bear bees, carpenter bees, and blue banded bees. And blue banded bees are a complex of 17 to 25 species last I heard, I haven't looked it up. So, so there's a lot, and the they, bands are very in colour. Really. And um, at one stage, one day, I was um, in the garden with a bird person, because I don't remember birds particularly well, and I had a grey fantail and a female robin that you couldn't identify, and they were flying out of the thicket of, like, my common centre was really dense, they were flying out, catching a few of, you can see they were catching the parasilia and blues and then flying back in. Now I've got, all of us have got quite a bad problem with noisy miners through no fault of their own. We just keep creating more and more open forest habitat for them and feeding them nectar. Um, but, um, but smaller birds need to have places to hide from them. So I was really happy to be out for a day to have, um, be able to support those birds. And then the other bit that um, of uh, complexity, if you can see it too, on that top caterpillar in the middle at the bottom, there's this little tiny white mark. You may not be able to see it. You might have to just accept my word for it. That is the egg of a tachnid fly. So that's that group of, I showed you a tachnid fly um, stalking that caterpillar earlier. It's a big family of flies. Um, there's actually tachnid flies that parasitise aquatic snails. They're gorgeous, so I have to tell you. I got turned on to flies as a 19-year-old by seeing these absolutely brilliant snail parasitising tachnid flies. Um, another story. Um, I got turned on to cockroaches too, but that's another story. Um, they are gorgeous. There's something like 650 species of cockroaches in Australia. We, we just got the story completely wrong, and it's not our fault. Most cockroaches are not coming into your houses, they're doing really important decomposition roles. You now I have to run and continue. Um, so, the ones that are in our houses are largely ones that we've transported around the world. So, it's our fault. Um, if you like fault, I don't like fault much, but people tend to like it. Anyway, so, um, so that caterpillar was on its way to becoming um, a fly or maybe two if it had waves on it. So that's biocontrol in action. Because you actually want things to be eating the insects that are eating the plants, otherwise, after a very short while, you can't actually work through any spaces. So. They do, they're nature's tip primers. They do our work for us. So then um, the native mulberry is also a good one for sort of flow on effects. It's a veritable smorgasbord tree. Usually it's like got all sorts of chews on it. You can find some interesting um, lace wings on it, which implies that it's, they've managed to live their life cycles on it. I don't know what they're eating. Uh, it gets a really cute little um, galling insect on it. Um, and that's another story I won't tell that one. Um, so um, back for about three years in the mid-2000s, um, a crested hawk would come into the garden for four to seven days, and I'd see it like diving into my native mulberries. Mine, I just let them come up, but I've got too many males at the moment, so some of them have to go. Makes a little bit more room for something else. Um, but yeah, so they, the herpetologists like native mulberries um, because of the grasshoppers, they can feed them to their lizards and stuff. 
the hero was feeding crystal pork, and crystal porks have been recorded as eating around stick insects. So, um, and yeah, so the native mulberry feeds two butterflies. This one, um, which has a preference for stinging trees in rainforest, but comes out quite often and starts some um, laying uh, on uh, native mulberry in the suburbs or the forest edges. Um, it also feeds a little blue called the speck of lime blue, and that's more reliable for that one. And it feeds, I think, some like four or five different hawk moth larvae, and anyway, so it's, in my definition of a smorgasbord tree for uh, invertebrates, and we can eat the fruit. It comes in male and female, so, but you seem to need a male somewhere nearby to get enough fruit. So that's sort of just like a little bit of what you can observe about how you can increase biodiversity by growing local or localish like native plants. So these ones are really just a few of um, uh, plants that um, we can share. So um, Cullen 10 x is ground covers. And, and it's my contention that we're actually losing biodiversity the fastest at the ground cover level. Because everywhere I go, the tree, I mean, it's going to affect the trees because there's a tipping point at some point that affects the habitat too much. But um, nearly everywhere where I walk in the Brisbane Valley area, I'm, I'm not seeing the native plants that I used to see. And I'm not no plant ID person, but I can recognise what was there that isn't there anymore. So we can eat the seeds of this plant. Uh, apparently they're roasted, they, uh, they're used as a substitute for poppy seeds. The pods get eaten by a few little um, native uh, little uh, blue butterflies. Um, so the this butterfly feeds on um, Bawara native guava. It's called native guava. Um, it makes delicious spiced rum. If you ever get a chance, there's a rainforest liqueur people accept groups of people to come and. Do tastings of these liqueurs they make, and uh, and you can get quite tipsy on their white rum flavoured with native um, plant flavourings, and that one is really delicious. Um, this plant, its reason partly for it being here is that it's pollinated by a weevil, just one species of weevil. So you, you, I've had the plant for years and never gotten flowers because I clearly haven't got the weevils. Um, it's a really ancient plant. So part of the story is that there's all sorts of pollinators on the planet and um, actually hoverflies are punching well above their weight as well and we're not getting that part of the story. So it isn't all about bees by any means. Um, and um, stinging nettle, not probably your first most obvious choice for growing greens but uh, it makes it look soup and tea and um, flavouring and there's a recipe for um, a lot of greens but you can use it to make pestos and things. Um, the, the quirky bit about this one is that there's a good chance that vegetarians get a lot of their protein from the unseen insects that they're eating. So if you're harvesting stinging nettle you have to actually look at the leaves because the caterpillars Pull the leaves up and the bin folds. So, forgive me, I'm a bit irreverent. Um, and then, just the last three before we go to questions are uh, three butterflies the dainty, the fuscus, and the orchard that all, all eat um, finger limes. And some of them eat other plants as well. So, the fuscus here on site. Um, is feeding a lot on um, uh, Glycosmus trifoliata, it's got two names in it. Um, and that has nice little uh, fruits that we can eat as well. So some of the book is about encouraging people to start thinking about whose food is it anyway and how much of it can we share. And so the orchard swallowtail is probably one of the better known ones. So to sum up quickly, um, I hope I've shown you that the main component of animal biodiversity is small unseen creatures that um, don't have backbones. Um, this is hopefully a helpful piece of information.
We need to start catering for the 34 out of every 100 named animals that are specialised and less specialised plant eating insects because that's feeding the rest of the food web. Uh, and local native plants support vastly more biodiversity than introduced plants. So I call most introduced plants some um, eye candy. They have got holes in them. They're barely even used by leaf cutter bees. Some of them are. Roses. Roses get eaten by the spiny leaf insects sometimes and leaf cutter bees cut out little circles. So it's got two uses, two environmental uses. And while I've been talking about plants and insects, and now I've not been talking about fungi and a whole range of other creatures and life forms, but basically they're all equally important and half the time we've got no idea just how important they are. And we keep making decisions as blind people not actually understanding what we're doing. Anyway, and we can all make a big difference by finding out what your local regional ecosystem was, finding out what plants lived there, Maybe if it's drying out, go for a nearby ecosystem that's um, a little bit drier and picking plants from there. And sorry, that went back, it's all by itself. Anyway, so I'm hoping that I've showed you something about learning to love larval life forms. I had fun with alliteration this way. First beautiful and bountiful biodiversity near you, or nurture nature near you, sorry, there's more ends in that one. And what really it's about is letting life thrive and flourish in our local local places and spaces. So, if there are any questions? We're, we're, it makes for pretty eye candy. And, I mean, there's so much more complexity even, I mean, I'm only skimming the surface. One of the really serious issues is that we're creating completely novel ecosystems, and that's just another way to create novelty in ecosystems. Um, yeah, native plants people were really into that um, early on, but some of them are getting more into sort of conservation. But yeah. But there's a whole industry, and there's a whole industry growing up in sending seeds of native plants across Australia. Uh, so I'm basically, my, my take is that we're all doing the best we can with the knowledge base we've got, most of the time, but by and large. And so I'm hoping that by publishing this book, and this is a preview version that's completed in and of itself, but it's a sample of what we want to put into a, a bigger one. Um, I'm hoping that we can help people adapt the model, the business model, so they stop doing that stuff. But we seem to always want to modify things. And also, you're really must messing up the phytochemistry of those plants, and then what can eat it and what can't eat it will be. So a bit of an example is um, uh, from, Tal from Douglas Tallamy. Uh, there's a, a Phragmites, it's a wetland in grass, it's very pretty grass. Um, we've got a species here. There's a, a UK species and an American species that are considered to be the same plant, but they're different genotypes. The Phragmites in the States was recorded as supporting 170 different species of creatures, and the, um, the introduced genotype supported something like 10, and that was after 300 years. So because there's, like, there's this general idea that I mean, that's only one example, and you can't generalise from it, but yet you have to start somewhere when you're thinking about this stuff. So um, so it's it's going to take millennia for things to adapt, to, except for the generalists that can adapt quickly, but that excludes all the specialists, and I, we, just, we just lose a lot by not looking at for the specialists. So does that answer your question? Uh, that's what that whole book is. <laughs> My co-author is uh, a permaculturist who's also in the Naturalist Club with me, so he's interested. Um, and, um, and he's quite knowledgeable. 
It's really weird because permaculture grew in Australia. I was running a bookshop back when it first came out and was selling the books. And somewhere along the line, it became about all sorts of introduced plants and mandalas and all sorts of pretty flowers from all around the world. There's not a reference, single reference to local natives. Now, naturally, there are some people that are working on it, but uh, a lot of the intention, well, one of the main intentions of the book is to try and reach that audience. So, and the idea being create more novel ecosystems, but start looking at how to interplant our food plants with local native plants that will support biodiversity. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that because it's a lot of plants are quite hard to cultivate. Native plants are quite hard to cultivate. Not all of them by any means, but um, but then you yeah, then there's a question of are we picking winners in that particular um, scenario as well. So it's really about yeah, looking at the system and how can we how can we do what we need to do and still make it as viable as possible for the maximum amount of biodiversity. But yeah, it's a big problem because I if I see that mandala from Finhorn come through on my Facebook page again, I'm going to shoot somebody. <laughs> um, not literally. Um, but I do give them a rating and this is, I need to do it more diplomatically. <laughs> the person's not, the people aren't in the audience, so. Um, yeah, so it's a big problem. It's a huge problem. And, and yeah, good bug mix. Don't even get me started on good bug mix. It's all North European plants or American plants. I don't know. They're, they're not local native flowering plants. And flowering plants, flowers aren't actually nearly as important as we're making them out to be. So, because we can see creatures use flowering plants that we grow at eye height, we tend to think that introduced plants are important for butterflies. But it's because we can see it. These, these animals have relationships with their plants and found their other resources in this environment for millennia, millions and millions of years before we came along and introduced a few pretty flowering plants. So they're, they're, like, they're non-essential. Was there any? Um, Sorry? Oh. oh, no, no, it's not for West End. It's for South East Queensland and New South Wales. It's just okay. based on this. Yeah. I'm talking bioregions and we're in what's called the Maclana First and Overlap, or was, and it's a zone where the subtropics and the temperate zone merge, and it gives us a much wider diversity than sort of other regions. There's another overlap in North Queensland that's also much more biodiverse, so. But all of it's moving south, so that's another issue again. But. Can you talk up really loud? Um, there's a, there are some native plant nurseries and there's habitat and bush care nurseries usually in a whole lot of catchments have got their own nurseries and they, they work really hard, they, they're community nurseries. Um, but yeah, so, and they, they don't get as much support. And the more they get calls for different species of plants, the more they'll be able to start thinking about propagating them as well. So, I mean, I started this process back in 1992 when I published a book called Butterfly Magic which was about trying to get nurseries to start growing native plants. And it's taken a few years um, and there's lots of other people that have been doing it as well. I'm not planning it for myself but yeah so it, it's, all a, it's all a work in progress and all we can do is the best we can but yeah go to your local catchment nursery in the first place given how mangled the Brisbane catchment is, like, and this is me talk, like my speculation, uh, if you can't get it from your local catchment group, then the Brisbane catchment in urban areas is reasonably close, better than going to somewhere much further flung. But um, the book has a few nurseries in it, but the next ones, we're hoping to have a fairly comprehensive list of local native nurseries. As, as this is just a this is a good sampler for what will be in it. If we'd done everything we wanted to, it would have taken another year and a half to finish it. So, and we wanted to get the idea out in the first place. So, any more questions? I noticed if you don't mow all of your yard at once, 
or you don't know all of your elements, some of them are you get a lot more into it, but they're mostly I'm sure weeding species. Are you doing more good than harm or the other way around? I think any level of biodiversity that you're enhancing is better than none, mm -hmm. um, because there are, that is habitat then for other creatures, so there's, you're starting to increase complexity, but at the moment, my garden has got mainly introduced weeds at the ground level. It sort of happened when I wasn't looking for a few years, um, as these things happen. Um, and so I'm, yeah, pulling out all, I haven't known for years, but um, I'm looking at native grasses. And, so the more, again, look at, I'm going to go and look at what WildNet says about the ecosystem, regional ecosystem, so it's complex, a bit of a complex process, but you can look at what your regional ecosystem is and then find out what the species were that were there. And so, yeah, so I'm going to look at that and see what I can introduce. And I'm just about to use the water from my washing machine to run it through a, through a bowl to filter it and let it go in the garden. Unfortunately, I can't use some of the other water or my sewage pipes clog up really quickly. Um, they're predicated on running a lot of water through them, sadly. But yeah, so yeah, I think that's a good And then the better idea is just stop mowing. And then introduce local natives, because yeah. But finding them to grow them is going to be the challenge. So yeah, I'd like I've got X hundred projects on the go. But one of them is to start sourcing people that are collecting local seeds from areas that are like in region and not in reserves and stuff like that. But yeah, so it's all about um, yeah, starting the process going, finding the seeds yourself, letting people know you've got them if they're nearby. Um, any other questions? Right, we're three minutes over time. Thank you.